Thanks for tuning into another Dolphins podcast. Jalen Ramsey was a dog. Chop Robinson got his first NFL sack. Tua Tagovailoa was slicing and dicing, dinking and dunking on the Buffalo Bills defense. But Joshua Houts, there are no moral victories in the NFL. There really isn't. And for as much as I'd love to come on here and say, you know, at least we, you know, what was it, 27 30, at least we hung in there. You mentioned Tua Tagovailoa slicing and dicing, probably one of his best games, honestly, in the NFL. Again, it still wasn't enough, so there's no moral victories, but uh, we're here to talk you through it and hopefully recap um, you know, what was a disappointing and heartbreaking loss to the Buffalo Bills, who, again, it looked like the Dolphins did everything right, and it still wasn't enough. For the third straight game, the Miami Dolphins have lost by one possession. For the second straight game, it came down to the wire. After last week's 28-27 loss to the Arizona Cardinals, the Buffalo Bills, Josh, scored 24 points in the second half, did whatever was absolutely necessary to escape this game with a victory. And Josh, being a Dolphins fan, Kind of like having spidey senses and not necessarily in a good way. At what point did you feel that this game was heading this direction? Obviously, Tyler Bass, he misses a give me extra point earlier in the game. He is straight up nails with that 61 yarder with about 10 seconds left in the game. Did, were those senses tingling for you at any point? Yeah, I mean, throughout the entire game, I mean, I think, <laughs> was it, even when it was just like 3-3, I think the game was tied up, and I'm like, oh, man, and then the Dolphins, I believe, went into the half 10-6, and again, you're just sitting there thinking, okay, I don't even know if they should have the lead at this point, and again, it's just that so Dolphins, you just know the inevitable, what what happened in the second half, it was inevitable, right, so um, I guess all throughout the game, the spider senses were tingling, and it just felt like, again, we all saw the outcome playing out right before our eyes throughout the entire game, and you just knew nothing was going to change it, right? Like, And it sounds like just being a battered and beaten Dolphins fan, but um, Josh Allen has his way with the Dolphins. The Bills have their way with the Dolphins, and um, we knew it was going to end up as disappointing as it did. But a 61-yarder, Jake, have you ever even seen – like, I don't know if that's the longest field goal I've ever witnessed. He's sitting in front of the TV, and just the fact that, like you mentioned, he's been pretty buns. They were, you know uh, – they had a uh, kicker bring, battle, Josh. Yeah, they had a kicker battle, and he just came in and just sliced that thing perfectly down the middle, and it would just rip my heart right out of my chest. It's so Dolphins, and I hate to use the phrase, it's so Dolphins, man, but that is exactly what it was. I'm going to be completely honest. From the start of the fourth quarter, I knew that this is going to be a game where um, I think the announcers said it was going to come down to whoever had the ball last. But because of a brutal man where he most fumble his second in three weeks, it, it wasn't going to come down to who had the ball last. It was going to come down if the Miami Dolphins could make a stop. Let's go back to the start of the fourth quarter. The Dolphins, Josh, faced a fourth and four from the Buffalo 25-yard line. Tua scrambles up the middle, man. What was going through your thoughts? Miami season on the line. Tua's putting it on the line there, fourth and four. Dove for it. The Bills challenged was unsuccessful. Yeah, I mean, it was a little bit of everything, right? Like, in that moment, you could see that Tua Tungvaloa was he, – he just was a football player. And we hear it in his pressers, and it sounds like, you know, he's going to continue to make the same decision over and over again. The game's on the line. He fully extended. And I'm kind of glad he just oh, – I'm very glad he just got down, right, as low to the ground as possible. His head was up, too. He it, was actually looking at where he was going. That is so important. It was beautiful. Yeah, it was beautiful. And, again, to get that in that critical moment, um, I was a little bit scared. But at the same time, once you saw it, he got the first, he got up, and he was, you know – signaling for a first down you got pretty damn excited and um it just goes it's a testament to Tui. you know no matter what the doctors say no matter what we say as fans it's hard in that moment game on the line to you know give up you're going for it giving it your all you can't fault to in that moment you're a gamer you're a player that's exactly what you expect Tua on the day 25 of 28 for 231 yards and two touchdowns josh we gotta have some hot takes here who you blaming whose fault is it that the miami dolphins lost on sunday when you go through the list, what's the first thing that makes you annoyed? I guess the way the defense crumbled, right? Like, just not being able to tackle. I, I'm watching that game, and it's just, you know, one play after another. Guys just completely whiffing the Marcus May one, man. I mean, it felt like you were playing Madden. You know when you're playing your boy and you're in the open field and you just don't want to get embarrassed? That's exactly what happened. But Marcus May was laying there embarrassed and huge touchdown. So it had to be the defense and just how they collapsed as a whole. But um, that Marcus May play, man. And then that Jordan Poor, as we'll talk about. I mean, so, so so many different things, but it all falls back to the defense, in my opinion. What were your thoughts? What were your takeaways? And who are you ultimately pointing the finger at from this one, Jake? It was brutal because, like, 
there are a couple different things that could have gone differently and the Miami Dolphins could have won this game. And I think a lot of people hear that and they think of those are mistakes. Like the Raheem Mostert fumble. If Tua doesn't fumble early in the game, that changes things. If this Dolphins defense, dude, could get one stop in the second half, it is absolutely insane to me that 24 points, Buffalo just marching up and down the field, man. It was it was a seemed pretty simple. 11 plays, 64-yard touchdown. Two plays, 70-yard touchdown, where it was, I think it was Ray Davis up the middle. No, yeah, Ray Davis, 63-yard pass where he just kind of scurried down the sideline. And, man, when you look at the big plays, the missed tackles, the penalties, the Jordan Poyer penalty on the final drive of the game, Josh, that would, would have been Buffalo's longest play of that drive, those 15 yards. And that was on a huge, huge third down. Oh, man, dude. I Jordan Poyer, he, he's the top of my list of I, I cannot believe the Miami Dolphins are put in a situation where Jordan Poyer can give away the game. So weird to me. You think back to free agency, how the Miami Dolphins approach the safety position. Deshaun Elliott, it seemed like for years, Chris Greer has found these guys, you know, they're able to come in and play well. You even have guys coming in, leaving, going elsewhere. Brandon Jones being awesome for the Denver Broncos. Signing Jordan Poyer for as cheap as you did at the start of free agency should have been a red flag of, hey, something's going on here. Man, Jordan Poyer, he stood by. The, the play where it was Keon Coleman going up the left sideline uh, seemed like a jump ball. I think Cam Smith had his hand in there. Jordan Poyer just came over the middle, blasted him. I think blasted is, is probably the most intense way I can say it. Uh, made him explode. I don't know. It seemed like he got a hist injury, wrist injury on the play. I just think if Poyer looked up, if he just kind of focused on the ball, I think he could have made a play on the ball. I think he could have intercepted that pass. Instead, on a key, crucial third and nine, it was the ball game. That was it. That was the last gasp for this Miami Dolphins defense, who, Josh, I do want to blame, and it's their fault the Dolphins lost, but you're down Javon Holland. You're down Bradley Chubb. You're down Jalen Phillips. You had Jalen Ramsey make a play. You had Jalen Ramsey make an awesome play. Like, you can't be having the negative plays. You you don't have the playmakers to have positive plays. It, it's the negative ones. That's just unacceptable from someone who was a team captain for so many years in the NFL. Yeah, and you, um, Zach Sealer's another guy they didn't have. And, I mean, I yeah. think um, we have to give him credit. You know, again, if we look at the end of the, the game, the second half, but there were a couple drives in the beginning of that game, right, that Buffalo got, uh, you know, the, the defense stood stood by down there at the goal. I made a stand and, you know, forced a field goal or whatever it might be. So it wasn't all bad from the defense. I Again, I think – this just to me is just a perfect representation of just the Buffalo Bills and what they've been. I mean, they are just the boogeyman. And again, no matter what we could have done, you mentioned every little thing, a turnover here, a sack here, you know, a, a non, you know, making a simple tackle in that Ray Davis, huge play. I mean, whatever it would have been could have changed this game, but it still feels like everything fell in the Dolphins way. And it still just wasn't enough to beat Josh Allen. And um, that's what leaves me the most frustrated here, man. It was like a damn near perfect game from two. Like you said, the defense, and it still just wasn't enough. Damn you, Josh Allen. Dude, that last drive, man, was just such a killer because it started from the Buffalo 30-yard line. There was a minute and 38 seconds left. Chop Robinson hits the scene with his first sack in the NFL. You're like, holy, the Bills have second and 14? This isn't going to be a situation where they just march down the field and they kick the game-winning field goal? At second and 14, man, you're thinking the Dolphins have two timeouts and two Sorry to get on a little tangent. It's incredible that the Dolphins lasted this far into a game without burning timeouts for dumb reasons X, Y, and Z. It was incredible that they didn't have the mid-third quarter confusion, the uh, beginning of the fourth quarter special teams blunder that also cost a timeout. The Dolphins were in a prime spot here, and then you have Josh Allen whiff on a pass to Dalton Kincaid. I think Deshaun Hand might have gotten a, dare I say, hand on it. But then, man, third and 14. Third and 14! Chop Robinson, neutral zone infraction, makes it third and nine, and it sets up that play to Keon Coleman. Uh, the pass to Keon Coleman that resulted in that Jordan Poyer unnecessary roughness. It's the negative plays, man. The negative plays are just so damn unacceptable because I don't think this team has all the playmakers. And it's a shame because Jordan Poyer, this would have been one of his best games with the Dolphins. He was a great tackler. I think he was targeted four times in coverage. He allowed like two receptions for like 16 yards. He was a really sound player where you're not going to get these big highlight tackles or these uh, highlight turnovers, but he looked like a, the, a sound safety when the Dolphins needed it. When you have Marcus May back there, you don't have Javon Holland. But man, you can't help but think about what Chris Greer could have done instead 
of Jordan Poyer, when you spent $2 million on your starting safety and, and you didn't really think twice about it and just started the season, I think Marcus May was like a summer summer camp signing and thought it was a good signing, but you thought they'd be a little more prepared in this situation. Jordan Poyer through seven games, I think he's been penalized three times, a face mask, and now two uh, personal fouls like this man. You can't make up ground in scenarios like that. You're giving away games, and Miami has no room for error. You know, I want to joke that he's that Trojan horse because I've been beaten that to death, but like it feels almost like at the same time, I kind of understand where he was coming from in that moment, right? I think I think it was McDaniel even said, you know, he, when you leave the strike zone, you got to make sure you don't miss. And he, he saw that he could, you know, make one of those game changing plays. You know, I'm sure when you we've all played football, even if it's just Madden, right? You see that you can have lay a lasting hit with that safety and you're coming over the top. But in that moment, man, leading with your head, I mean, he has been absolutely a problem for that Dolphins defense. And I think the one thing I'm going to start realizing, you know, whether it was Dalvin Cook a few years ago, the Odell Beckham Juniors, you know, the Jordan Poyers, I'm done getting hyped about these old players and their names, right? It's time to, to stop uh, letting them pull the wool over our eyes because Jordan Poyer could not be any better than what we would have if we kept the Sean Elliott. could not be anywhere near better than what they would have had that Brandon Jones. So, um, yeah, damn you, Chris Greer. But it, it's just, um, yeah. This performance, Josh, from the offense, I thought was so damn impressive. You know, we were panicking for so long. Hey, the offensive line's an absolute mess. Hey, this offense can't move the ball whatsoever. What an incredible, impressive performance from this unit, man. 17 points in the second half, though. It seemed like the Dolphins were able, were going to lay a haymaker, something they haven't done once this season, right? They're two wins, one possession games. Outside of that, they've lost a bunch of games. Lucky us. We thought that first drive coming out of the half, Miami was going to be like, all right, we're going to be serious here. We're going to see if we can extend, push past the Buffalo Bills. First play of the drive, he Mostert, seven yards. The next play, Raheem Mostert, 15 yards. That's a quick 22 yards. Third play, Josh Raheem Mostert, seven yards, but then he drops the ball on the ground for his second fumble in three weeks. I think when I hear, you know, Tua have lines like, hey, brother, no worries, we got time. There, there just seems like we knew this was coming. Not that the offense couldn't put up points. They put up 27 points again last week. There are just so many minor inconsistencies with this team that are going to rear their ugly head at some point that they can't overcome it. And when the margin of error is so small, you can't overcome it. Did you see anything like that from the, you know, you saw the bills get a turnover. So I mean, I'm going to back up a little bit and let you talk my bad. No, no, man, you're completely right. And I think, um, I guess my biggest takeaway or the nicest thing from this thing is that Raheem Mostert understands that's an issue, right? He's sitting there saying it's BS. This isn't me. I need to get better, but that's your most trustworthy back. And for him to cough the ball up in that moment, that is not what you want. And um, from here, I'm interested to see how they change things, right? I mean, Devon Achan, you can really not put much more on this guy's plate, right? I, we joked that he was wide receiver two a few weeks ago. I ran the numbers, man. He's actually leading the team in uh, receptions and touchdowns as a receiver. So he's maybe more so our wide receiver one, but you cannot put any more on his platter. So at that point, you want to see Jalen Wright get more intricate. So maybe that's what we see going over the next few weeks. But um, Raheem Mostert, man, for a guy that was so clutch, you know, a year ago, what do you have? 20 touchdowns, absolutely breaking every record. Um, he's been a bit of a problem. And losing a fumble in that moment, that's when you could definitely feel, you know, your spidey senses were tingling up until that point. And then it was like, oh, no, man, same old Dolphins. Here we go again. To a 25 of 28, 231 yards, two touchdowns, quarterback rating of 89.2. Josh, those numbers aren't like insane. Those aren't. Baltimore Ravens a couple of years ago numbers. What are your thoughts when you hear people say that the offense didn't play well, just from the fact they didn't have a lot of those big plays. We did see uh, Tyreek Hill catch like a, a nice dot from Tua 28 yards down the field. But outside of that, it was a lot of plays didn't really go above 20 yards, stayed within that, that type of range. Yeah, and it's kind of funny because I post the next-gen passing chart and I try to leave it as vague as I can. And you have people sitting there saying, you know, you're perfect game for two and others saying, oh, he's a game manager and things like that. I mean, I think both things can be true and it's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, we see defenses taking away those big plays, using those safeties and trying to keep everything in front of them. And based on that, the way Tua Tungvalo went out there, you know, executed, I think it's three incompletions. One was a, a arguably a drop. One we just end up – it was a design screen just threw with the guy uh, – 
running back's legs. And I can't remember the other one. So, I mean, this was as about as close to a perfect game as it uh, you could ask for from Tua. But like you said, there weren't any deep passes downfield. And that's kind of, I guess, what's been make or break for this Dolphins team, right? We're putting up 70 points against the Broncos a few years ago. It's because they were making those big plays that we're not converting on this year. So, um, I guess that's my long-winded way of saying that was an awesome game from Tua Tagovailoa, but again, it just wasn't enough, and that's where I'm just sitting here left wondering, like, what more can you do other than hold on to that ball if you're Raheem Mostert or, you know, maybe connect on a deep play here or there. But um, I thought the offense executed well, and when you saw Tua Tagovailoa go out there and do those things mixed with that run game, I mean, again, man, that was almost a perfect performance from the offense, and it was all for not. It, I just keep going back to that. I was so impressed with Tua's pocket presence. Um Anytime he has to go on the move and start freelancing, him and Jalen Waddle are like prime Lil Wayne when it becomes just a dropping a freestyle. That that touchdown play, man, it was so nice. And that's I think we saw. I'll even say nicey. We'll give John Gruden a little bit of a shout out there. Um, there were a couple plays where I think Tua did a great job, really understanding like it's a four man rush. I, I need to escape the pocket here, but I don't have to go absolutely crazy and break off and run. I think he had a couple great plays where he was comfortable in the pocket. Uh, what would you think of this rushing food chain? You did have Devon Achan leading the way, 12 carries, 63 yards. Raheem Mostert, 10 carries, 56 yards. I think he only had one carry post-fumble. Jalen Wright, third, six carries for 18 yards. But, dude, we do have to include that it wasn't just Devon Achan, 12 carries for 63 yards. It was Devon Achan, 12 carries for 63 yards and eight receptions for 58 yards on top of that as well. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I think I like the way this food chain was going. I mean, I'm intrigued again, the way it goes after the Raheem Mostert consistent fumbles. I mean, you want to get Jalen Wright more involved, right? Up until this point, even so, but now that Raheem Mostert is putting that ball on the ground, I mean, I'd like to see more of Jalen Wright out there, maybe with Devon H and using him more, but um, I'm just so impressed with Devon H and because again, you have this roster with so many huge names, right? Whether it's Teron Armstead, whether it's, you know, two time below Tyree kill, the list goes on and on of just players offensively. And Devon H and seems to be the most dynamic player, right? He's the check down guy into his, you know, going through his progressions. The last guy dumps off to him. He gets a huge play. He's that guy that can go between the tackles and do a little bit of everything. So um, we have a superstar right before our eyes. I just don't know how, uh, sustainable it is, right? He's what, like 5'8"? Someone said baby zonk. I mean, how sustainable is it to continue to feast, force feed him like he's at early 2000 Ricky Williams? I don't know, but get Jalen Wright more involved. That's what I was trying to say. Yeah, I'd reel it back to like eight carries, especially, man, if you're going to be able to get him eight receptions. And that's why I thought this offense played so well because against the Bills, I don't think you win by hitting the big plays because if you hit a 80-yard touchdown or if you hit a seven-play 80-yard touchdown, the Bills still get the ball back and the Bills offense still put up 24 points. I think being able to sustain drives kind of melt away some clock. Josh, this game hit the two minute in the first half mark where every other game, I was incredible just scrolling through all the times. They, all the other games were at about nine minutes still. Tua's decision-making was absolutely on point here, just taking what the off, uh, defense is giving you and let your playmakers do that, just make plays. But man, this is a very, very weird uh, Way to look at the receiving group. So you had Tyree Kill, team high 80 receiving yards. Johnu Smith targeted six times. He caught four, or excuse me, five of them for 46 yards. Odell Beckham Jr., three receptions for 15 yards. And Josh, probably the most unique stat line we're ever going to see. Jalen Waddell, two receptions for a negative four yards and a touchdown. How about them apples? Did you have Waddle in any of your fantasy leagues? Because I definitely did. And I'm oh, just oh, <laughs> like, come on, man. Odell Beckham Jr., though. I mean, I'm glad he finally got involved. I feel like we were just trolling him on Twitter. I think I even joked that there were robot dogs that had the same amount of catches. So <laughs> it was nice to finally see him getting involved. But um, I was kind of impressed with Jalen Waddle kind of being a ghost the entire game. And then I think there was a clutch third down reception, correct me if I'm wrong, for a first down. And then that extended play where they found Waddle in the end zone for a touchdown where I just saw you tweet it, Jake. He didn't even want a, a Waddle. Like Odell Beckham Jr. ran up to him, Tyreek Hill. And I just imagine him saying, you know, it's about time you guys got me the ball. And um, if that is what uh, Jalen Waddle would have said, I mean, I don't think anybody can blame him. But um Need to get Tyreek Hill more plays. Heading into this game, I think he only had 30 receptions, and I made sure I tweeted out that was $1 million per reception for Tyreek Hill heading into that game on oh, the season. <laughs> it is worth noting that Tyreek Hill in his entire career, what, he was drafted in 2016, never once has he reached 100 receiving yards against the Buffalo Bills. I thought they had a good game plan to get Tyreek involved with his four receptions for 80 yards. But, Josh, back, back to Jalen Waddle because what a hard game, and it speaks to – 
you need to be on for all four quarters, all 60 minutes. Ghost, for, for roughly, what, 56, 57 minutes? It's numbers called on the third down. Nails, catches it first down. Next play, cleated in the back of his leg by Damar Hamlin. I think the announcer said they had to go like get blood wiped off the back of his leg, and then he comes back in the game. I think it was even the next play and is still available for that touchdown. That's guts, man. And, and when you think about the fact that the Dolphins are in a very tough spot, they have nobody to blame but themselves. We've, I think, been pretty positive this show. We've been pretty positive this show, despite the fact it's pretty shameful that the Dolphins sit at two and six. The season, man, it's not over, but it's going to be a fun about a month. And then we're going to get some Thursday night, maybe Thanksgiving game. There's going to be one cold weather game like the Titans in the past. But either way, you see what's happening with the Saints. You see scenarios that teams are two and six, things aren't going well, and the locker room is gone. If you want any hope for the Dolphins, it's the fact that Jalen Waddell hasn't been involved this season. He entered this game with no touchdowns, comes in, has that key third down, scores the touchdown, and then has a negative 23-yard gain to finish the day with a negative four yards. The fact you are still not hearing, you know, sassiness, upsetness. Yeah, you'll hear a Tyree Kill tweet, a Devon a or a Odell Beckham tweet, but I mean, it doesn't feel like this season is completely out the window. It doesn't seem like this roster is in a position where they're ready to give up just yet. And you wonder how much of that is just knowing, right, that a lot of these losses came with Tua Tungvaloa, you know, on the out for four weeks and things like that. And, I, I mean, I, I, you're right, Jake. They're playing with a ton of heart, and I think that was what I really wanted to see this week. And we came into this, and I think your opening statement was we're not going to have any moral victories. But in a way, you know, continuing to grind and play with Plot so much heart, <laughs> right, <laughs> and, and to lose by a 61-yard field goal when your offense played that good, yeah. So oh. um, maybe, maybe it was a little bit of a moral victory, but – um. Yeah, they're not laying down. They're not dying. I think even Teron Armstead today was uh, asked about, you know, were you even considering being traded? And he said, you know, not at all. This is where my heart is and things like that. So it doesn't sound like the locker room's given up. And again, when you're an outsider, when you're sitting here as a Miami Dolphins fan, right, we don't want to have to go through this endless cycle again and again. We'd much rather see them fight their way out of this hole and somehow be that one team that we can talk about over the last, what, 50 years that came back from two and six, made the playoffs, this and that. But, um, at some point, we just got to stop with the hope and got to see results. And I'm spinning out of control because, again, moral victory, but it's just another loss to the damn Bills. And it hurts, man. It really hurts. We are recording this shortly after 4 p.m. on Tuesday. That means the trade deadline has come and gone. Josh, the Miami Dolphins are on their second three-game losing streak. We're talking about there's no moral victories, but yet it's still pretty fun to see this Miami Dolphins offense play like this. How do you feel about how this trade deadline has come and gone? The Dolphins haven't always been a big spender, a big player at the trade deadline. However, last year they did trade for Chase Claypool. They did have Mapletron for a few weeks, and that worked out so well. The year before, they did push the chips in and trade for Bradley Chubb. The results haven't been as what we wanted, but I still stand by. I think that was a good trade and a good move for the Dolphins. 2021, they didn't make a trade. 2020, the Dolphins made the big move for DeAndre Washington. 2019, Akib to leave. The Dolphins traded for him, and I think they got a draft pick out of it as a result. I don't think he – he never even, I think, put on a single piece of Dolphins merchandise. We can't even confirm if he was in Florida for a single hey, – he was on the Bucks, but we can't confirm that he was in Miami. Uh, 2018, no trade. So, Josh, there were some rumors. Clias Campbell, is someone going to give you a seventh-round pick for Raheem Mostert or J Jeff Wilson? Probably not. Uh, instead, the Miami Dolphins sat on their hands, did nothing. What are your thoughts? I think I'm okay with it. I think originally I was sitting there saying, you know, you should be sellers, free Kalias Campbell, you know, move some pieces if you can. I think we even talked about Javon Holland potentially, you know, maybe Bradley Chubb if he comes back. But like you said, this team has not, you know, given up. And um, there's no reason to sell some of those players who might be part of the long-term thing. And then not being buyers, I mean, I'm not really surprised by that, right? I mean, if you're Stephen Ross and you've seen what you – the resources that you've given Chris Greer and company and all the players that you've gone out there and acquired, uh, Bradley Chubb, Tyree Kill, all the huge contracts, I don't know. You say, okay, so now I'm going to give you uh, – allow you to go out there and get, even spend more money, right? Give up more draft capital and things like that. I was even going to joke. It'd be so cool if uh, Chris Greer just trade away every draft pick so we never had to see a single mock draft this draft season. <laughs> I was going to tweet that out, but I thought someone might get upset. But all seriousness, oh, I'm o I'm okay with what the Dolphins did. Um, I saw it could have gone either way but deep down i did want to see calais campbell get at least a chance to go elsewhere but that would have left a huge huge hole in the dolphins defense so you can see why they didn't and who knows he might not even have wanted to go play elsewhere that was the one where 
you give the hat tip and you're like, all right, Kalias, if you want to go get paid or uh, go try to have that playoff push, go right ahead. But I mean, if you're the Dolphins, like you're not doing it for a seventh round pick. And if your team trying to trade for Kalias Campbell, are you trading more than a seventh round pick for a 38 year old defensive tackle? I mean, he's been awesome. And, and so I'm glad he gets to stick around in Miami. And I hope we can kind of give him a little bit of a run for his money here. Uh, you did mention Zach Sealer. It does sound like he's going to be coming back this week, which would be a huge, huge boost for this uh, Miami Dolphins team. Josh, you bring up a great point. I will say after this week, I'm done with Chris Greer. I, I don't want him using any more draft capital. I, I think this was the final mark where um, you've said it in the past, and, and I completely understand where you're coming from, where the idea of you don't want to you know, play Q, get rid of some people, keep some other people, and, and just try to reload that way. I just see too much from Mike McDaniel. I thought this game plan against the Bills, I thought everything was working very well for the Dolphins, but I, I can't deal with this Chris Greer process anymore. I, I can't deal with the Jordan Poyers. Saran Neal was was fine. He was solid. Uh, uh, Marcus May. The, these the, the Chris Greer process, for the good and the bad, I don't care. I've had enough of it. And I, again, I think some of his biggest flaws was just not re-signing guys that he drafted or the acorns that he found. Like, and just to think that that's going to be his biggest thing. But I, I'm entirely with you, Jake. And I think the biggest thing for me is I can sit here and say, you know, I don't want to see, uh, you know, the GM that they bring in uh, hypothetically being stuck or forced to keep Mike McDaniel around. But at the same time, like you said, we do not need to see Mike McDaniel go off and be the coach of another team, be that genius that we've already seen and take them to the promised land. So I am still fully supportive of Mike McDaniel, but I do think you got to get rid of Chris Greer. And if that, you know, at, at that point, you, the next GM wants to have full control and, you know, implode the entire thing, I guess I'll understand it. But again, you've seen way too much promise with what Mike McDaniel's done here with what he's done with Tua Tungvaloa alone, right? I mean, you hate the way this offense turns into a pumpkin without him, but you built a team for him. This is the offense that you built. And, um, you know, when they're healthy, when they're out there, it's pretty damn unstoppable uh, unless you're the Bills. So that you, you kind of had an alarm go off for me there because you mentioned like if a new GM wants to come in and blow it up, Josh, I, I don't know. I, I could see a scenario where I think that'd be a, a – path for the Dolphins I, I just look at this group and you found I think the Dolphins have the players in place to win football games Josh this offensive line looks pretty good the only reason Tua was sacked on Sunday is because he put the ball on the ground we were too busy eating chips I mean I think Robert Jones had like a, a PFF grade of like 32 for the week it was super ugly but I mean uh, you have Teron Armstead, arguably the best left tackle when he's out there on the field, and he's been out there a lot of the season. Aaron Brewer continues to be an absolute stud at center. And dare I say, Josh, I saw Liam Eichenberg on the ground, but when he was on the ground, it was 10 yards upfield, meaning he was blocking someone that far away from the play. So it's incredible what happens when you have an offensive line that can actually play a couple games together and string together some continuity after last year where you had like 14 different offensive line combinations. It's just terrible, man, because this team, part of it's the way it's constructed, part of it's been injuries and bad lucks, bad luck. They just can't walk in the same direction at the same speed at the same time. There's just not that, that continuity. There's not that football where they're eating off of each other. It just, that's what's missing from this Miami Dolphins team. And, it, and it's, it's frustrating as all hell. Yeah, and you're saying that, and I'm realizing a lot of it's just bad luck, right? You're having injuries on the offensive line at one time. Okay, and it's also with the way this <laughs> roster has been built. So we can, again, throw a shade at Chris Greer. But um, I do think I have to have egg on my face. You mentioned Liam Eichmer playing okay. I think Robert Jones, besides that PFF grade, you know, they've been – Okay, but Aaron Brewer's been playing out of his mind. Teron Armstead, I think Austin Jackson's also been playing well. So the offensive line, you know, when that was that big glaring thing, I love to post that video of uh, Chris Greer. Uh, you're more worried about than we are. But, you know, as of now, that is not the reason the Dolphins are losing games. And you have to give a hat tip to Teron Armstead, who's playing out of his mind at this age. And Aaron Brewer, who I, I'll be the first one to admit I wanted Connor Williams back, or at least, you know, at least the, him to be on the Dolphins' radar. So, there are some misses, some huge misses, as we've talked about, but um, you got to give a little bit of credit, right? Just a little bit of credit. But at the same time, it's Teron Armstead. We already knew he was like a Pro Bowl Hall of Famer. I mean, I don't know that Ter Chris Greer gets that much credit for just paying him a ton of money. That was Stephen Ross's, right? No, he he absolutely does not. Yeah, it, especially on, on the defensive side, man. I, I think uh, Anthony Weaver is is a good defensive coordinator. I think they do some decent things. And what we saw on Sunday was the difference between uh, Jalen Ramsey when he 
is in coverage and Jalen Ramsey when he's stuck chasing people around the field. You see that he's still that dog. I thought that interception was absolutely impressive. I, I do kind of wish, Josh, the Dolphins made some sort of move. There, there were a couple different players. Uh, Packers edge rusher Preston Smith, he was traded for for like a seventh round pick. I think there was a defensive lineman. Let me see if I can pull it up here. Uh, Khalil Davis from the Texans, he went to the 49ers for a seventh round pick. And, and that just goes back again to Chris Greer, where if the Dolphins wanted to make a move at the trade deadline, a lot of people are like, me included, oh, Jesus Christ, don't let Chris Greer use all our draft capital or anything like that. But these are seventh round, sixth round picks. He's been in the league so long, and he should know his team's strengths and weaknesses and some guys around the league who could fit in that so well where Chris Greer could have used this opportunity to get a win in the margins. Hey, I got this guy for a seventh round pick. The safety came in and he had two turnovers for us. Hey, I got this defensive tackle. He made a couple of tackles for loss in the backfield as part of the rotation. That would have been a great opportunity for Chris Greer. I'm not saying to go invest a first or a second. Don't go crazy at the trade deadline. But you see these teams, I don't want to say playing scared, but you know these trades in the margins where it's a, a late round draft pick, that's something where Chris Greer, I think, could have, should have done and probably could have found a way to help the team here. Yeah, while we're piling on him, what were your thoughts on Matt Collins? I mean, there's nothing I despise more than seeing that big, lanky body, you know, making some of those tough catches. And he's a player that, you know, is awesome on special teams. Um, would have been, uh, honestly, maybe the perfect wide receiver three here. So that's another guy that um, you're watching that game and you're just like, come on, Chris Greer, man. That was a, um, a guy that was right in front of you. Another question, Jake, and I know I'm spiling out of control, but what if you went for two there at the end of the game? I mean, I know that was a huge talking point. I know I'm backtracking a little bit, but I feel like with how much time was left, I mean, you kind of foresaw what was going to happen. And I don't know that you would have wanted to have that game end in that moment, right? If you messed up that two point conversion, but part of you had to at least think about it if you're Mike McDaniel. Part of it, you would have had to think about it for sure. However, uh, I think they made the right decision. I think Buffalo would have been more aggressive and probably would have got more yardage. I think the worst part about this Miami Dolphins team is the lack of edge rushers. I, I don't think people understand how that has completely changed everything that this defense is trying to do. Josh, 30, we didn't have any talk about David Long being benched. Oh man, we're burying all the leads here. We're, it was right over our head. Sorry about that. But not for Channing Tindall, though. Not for <laughs> Anthony Walker looked pretty damn good, though. He was around the ball, and, and that's the thing. I, I, there's going to be scenarios where running backs make catches. Tight ends, Trevor Brad has a, is a big day. It's about limiting the damage. It, it's about making the tackle, not letting him go for an extra ten yards. You don't have the edge rushers to get into a second and 20 situation with a sack or something like that. So, so Josh, I think they made the right decision. I think if they got it and made the uh, a two point try. I think Buffalo just pushes the ball a little harder than they did. And I, I think they still would have gotten there. I, I, what are your thoughts? No, that's where I was. I would have been the scared guy. I would have definitely kicked the field goal and been more than content, hopefully maybe going to overtime in the same situation Dolphins did. But like you said, no matter what, the spidey senses were tingling. We knew Josh Allen was going to make a play. And that one play he made, oh, my God. I don't even want to think about that. What the hell was that? And then there's just this bit, dude just goes up there and Venus fly traps out of the air. The, the touchdown throw, man, where he just threw it. And it was great, dude, because we saw Josh Allen do that, where he throws the ball while he's getting tackled by two guys escaping the pocket. Tua's touchdown to Waddle was like his version of that. So we saw like the playmaking Tua. We saw the back and forth. It was so much fun. Uh, but but yeah, man, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I just, this defense, man, they, they I'm, sp I'm with you. I'm spiraling out of control. You brought up uh, Mac Collins. We have Mac Collins at home. His name's Eric Azukama. Uh, well, you had one more question for me, Josh. I'm sorry. I might've already. No, yeah, I don't remember. I, yeah, we're definitely spying out of control because we started by saying there's no moral victories. I kind of thought maybe there was, but you're still two and six, man. You still can't beat the Bills. Like, what are we doing here? And that's why Sunday was so frustrating. We wanted to take an extra day because it could have just been, hey, come in on here, fire everybody, whatever it may be. But took an extra day to digest the information. I hope we were able to give you something a little fresh, a little different a couple days after the fact. But that is it. That is all the time we have today on another Dolphins podcast. If you're liking what you're listening to, please, please, please hit that subscribe button. And if you have a minute to leave a comment, leave a rate, leave a review, that helps other people find the show and that helps us helps out us all out a bunch. So we thank you for that. You want to send us an email, another Dolphins podcast at gmail.com. And we also follow along with the comments on the 560 WQAM YouTube channel. So drop something there and we will probably talk about it. I'd say we talk about it, Josh, but that is it. Thank you all so much for listening to another Dolphins podcast. Have a wonderful day. And most importantly, fins up. Fins up. <laughs>